20 Battles Searching for a South African Way of War is a book by military historians Evert uh, Kleinhans and David Brock Katz. The core authors investigate the evolution of South Africa's armed forces over a century. They track the evolution of the policy, structure of the defense force, and the lessons learned in past battles and operations. For our book, book review this morning, we're joined virtually by the co author Evert Kleinhans. Evert, a very good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Morning, Supriwe. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity. It's a pleasure. It all is a pleasure. Now, the book identifies a number of firsts for the Defence Force. So, when did you start doing your research and putting this book together? Uh, well, David and I, this has probably been the product of about 10 years' worth of work. So, since our days, uh, busy, you know, when we were doing our master's degrees, all the way up through our doctoral studies, and to some more recent uh, uh, research. So yes, it's a, it's a culmination of 10 years worth of, uh, you know, digging in the dusty archives, reading a lot of books, yeah. and just talking to each other about, you know, this uniqueness of the South African way of war. Mm. And I know that you are a senior lecturer at the Department of Military History, the Faculty of Military Science at the Stellenbosch University, but speak to us about your interest in the South African Defense Force. Uh, I am actually, I'm a military brat. I grew up uh, with a okay. father who served in the Defence Force and uh, I also served in uniform myself. But uh, I've had a lot of passion for South African military history. Um, I think our country has such a diverse military history. It's often tragic and sad, but it shaped and it moulded our society where we are today. So, you know, we have to, we have to investigate warfare in South Africa to sort of have a look where we came from. Maybe we've got an idea of where we're going to. Now, over the years, what has been the main change and evolution of the armed forces? So, I think um, South Africa has always had a very small permanent force to start with. From the inception of the Department of Defense in 1910 sort of and to the formation of the Union Defense Force in 1912, there's always been a, a small backbone of permanent soldiers that was always bolstered by a large reserve force. So, in the event of war, the reserves would be called up and they would they would flesh out the defense force in terms of numbers. South Africa has always been casualty adver adverse and we see this uh, from the, the First World War going on even to most recently to um, the Central African Republic in 2013 with uh, the Battle of Bangui that we we don't we can't stomach losses. We are not mm. uh, we're not built built for that. So if you consider the tragedies that uh, Dalbo Wood in 1916, uh, Sidi Reza in 1941, Tobruk, you know, thousands of South African soldiers either lost their lives in, in battle or were made prisoners of war. So if you think of Bangui in uh, 2013, 13 South African troops lost their lives. But for countries such as ours, that's a major loss of life. So that, that's always been, I think, one of the, the key points of the, of, the, of the South African way of war. And then also we are maneuverist. We like to conduct maneuver type warfare operations and you can trace this back even to the way that Chaka Zulu and some of the earlier uh, black communities in Africa fought as well so there's a there's a there's a uniqueness in in how the South Africans prefer to, prefer to fight maneuver type battles and not sit down and get bogged down in static type operations where we you know have to sort of relentlessly attack against a, a predetermined objective or against an enemy that's that's well entrenched. So I think, I mean, we can talk about this for a long time, but that's sort of the basis of all of this. Yeah, it's quite interesting that uh, you mentioned that, and especially that Bangui tragedy. And when we speak of the South African military force, one can sort of pick up their unique command style, which sets them apart from other armies. Why is that, though? So, so typically in South Africa, we don't... Uh, we, I mean, we used to, we, we <laughs> sorry, let me just get myself there. We prefer mission command. So where uh, um, junior officers or mid-ranking officers and even NCOs have the ability to uh, use their initiative on the ground to, to make decisions as, as the battle or the operation progresses. Um, if something happens, they can make on-the-spot decisions. They don't have to go all the way back up the chain of command again to, yeah. to, to get authority to do something. And I think we, when our defense force, we can see that we've we've gone through all of these from a sort of a mission command to a directive command where, you know, the, the general will the, will tell the, the soldier right on the ground what to, to almost be doing. He'll have, a, he'll have an input. So at times our defense force have gone through, uh, you know, periods where there's a lot of initiative given to lower commanders, especially in terms of when there's actual warfare. 
And I think during peacetime periods, uh, such as between the First World War and the Second World War, and, and even where we are finding ourselves today, I think we move more to a directive style of command where it becomes a lot more uh, centralized, a lot more bureaucratic, and the ability to be uh, innovative or to just use some innovation becomes quite difficult. Now, this book, Evert, also speaks on, you know, the battlefield drama, which we're not often exposed to. Please share a bit more on those. Yes, uh, we, we we try to stay away from some of the, the, the politics, uh, of course, uh, behind these battles. The book uh, didn't allow to, to get stuck into uh, all of the political intricacies that, that went behind Africa's participation in, in some of these wars or the battles and the operations. But they, there's a lot of drama that goes with this. I mean, uh, I think we've tried to highlight it in a number of these battles that showed the sheer doggedness and the persistence of South African soldiers uh, throughout a uh, tree worth of warfare. So um, just, just you know, off the top of my head, thinking about the experiences of the South African soldiers in uh, in France and Flanders in the First World War, the Battle of Delville Wood, that fought against um, relentless German attacks that, that, that um, you know, they suffered heavy casualties in, in doing so, but they they conducted themselves very well against very, like, defying odds. And then, you know, uh, the Second World War, one of my favorites, I think, that, that comes out in this book, and that that's a, lot has, a lot has really been written about it, is the Battle of Chihusi, um in uh, June 1944. Also, you know, it was not a great, uh, it was not a great event for the South Africans, but, uh, um yeah, it, it actually showed us, you know, how quickly things can go wrong if uh, there's improper coordination, if there's not good command of control, and how, you know, a company of soldiers find themselves in this hilltop town in Italy and they face the might of a German attack and it doesn't really go well for them. So, so yes, throughout the book, uh, there, there are great little accounts where I think we can see how the South Africans conducted themselves under fire, often under trying conditions, but, um, yes, they always... Uh, they always got the job done. Yeah, you speak of uh, how South African soldiers conducted themselves under fire, you know, in foreign service. But uh, I want us to extend this analysis and discussion to the performance of South African Army in, uh, you know, in foreign service, in particular at the peacekeeping missions. Because uh, we do understand that, uh, for instance, the South African Army is struggling in the peacekeeping mission in the DRC so much that uh, it might even miss being included in the SADAC regional force. So, be where you like asking difficult questions on a Sunday morning, but uh, <laughs> I'll, give it a, I'll give it a go. Um, yes, I think, you know, if we look at the South African National Defence Force since 1994, um, there's really been a few highlights, you know, about the employment in terms of the employment of force. Um, first of all, there was the intervention in Lesotho in 1998, that was uh, basically almost a peace enfor enforcement type of an operation. And then since the early 2000s, the SNDF has been involved in peacekeeping um, deployments from Burundi to the DRC, even to um, the Sudan. So I, I think the Defence Force has done very well, well, exceptionally well, given uh, the fiscal constraints that the Department of Defence faces, uh, problems in terms of uh, manpower, organisation. I think um, if you... If we are honest with one another, every time there's there's a problem in the country, whose button gets pressed on, and it's often the defence mm. force. So, so so yes, um, if we just think back to the uh, unrest in 2021, and you know a host of different different um, examples can be given, but the defence force, I think, with the meagre resources that it has, is doing well. It doesn't mean that there is not uh, um, some concerns. But I think the Department of Defense is doing very well in that regard. Um, okay. Under-resourced, underfunded, but maybe if, 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 if correct funding comes our way, we can maybe do a whole lot better. All right, Ivet, great chatting to you, man. Thank you so much for your time. And what I love about this book is the fact that it exposes us to a different facet of the South African army, which uh, we're not often exposed to. Thank you so much for this. And it's an absolutely beautiful read.